All right, good evening, everybody. This is the regular meeting of the Downers Grove, Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education here on Monday, October 9, 2023 at 7 p.m. here at the Downers Grove Village Hall. This meeting is being live streamed for the public and the Village of Downers Grove's YouTube channel. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Joshi. Here. Member Ellis. Here. Member Hannes. Here. Member Harris. Here. Member Olchik. Here. Member Weiner. Here. Member Hughes. Here. Tonight, members of the audience will have an opportunity to provide public comment to the board later on in the agenda. The board asks anyone wishing to uh, comment uh, to please fill out a card to indicate the topic to be addressed. These can be placed over there in the basket all the way over there to my far right. All right, we're going to go ahead and start like we always do with the Pledge of Allegiance. I'd like to welcome up the student council from O'Neill Middle School and their principal, Principal Harry. Home for us. Sorry. <laughs> Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> all right. Good evening, Board of Education. Um, it is my pleasure to present and talk about O'Neill tonight and give you a little bit of background about how things have ha uh, been going in the last spring um, as we transition into a new school year. Um, I've brought with me some very fun, amazing, talented young ladies as well to speak. I have my assistant, uh, Mrs. Danielle Bongiorno here. I also have Sarah Mahija. I have Kira Olson and Lydia Larson as well to speak. So they're gonna share some insights because as you all know, we are both new, um, Ms. Bongiorno and I, so we know a little bit, but um, they, these young ladies have agreed to kind of share some highlights of the things that we get to look forward to as O'Neill senators throughout the school year. So um, without any further ado, I'm gonna move forward here. Um, just wanted to share a picture. This is our staff, which um, we are very, very proud of. We had um, definitely some retirements and some changes at O'Neill, and um, so we worked very, very hard to make sure that we were fully staffed and ready to go for our first day of school. And so that's a picture of our O'Neill staff on the first day. Um, we also wanted to start off this school year with a theme. And so um, this is when Jorno and I talked and we felt like really the idea is that obviously we're new, there's so much to learn and we really have to be a team and we have to work together. And that's super important for kids to understand that message as well because when we work together, we are so much better off. Um, there's so much insight that we can gain from other people and their perspectives and experiences and that's what's gonna make us strong and successful. And um, certainly Mrs. Buongiorno and I can't be more thankful for the incredible staff of O'Neill as they have, oh, um, <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's a little <laughs> Um, we couldn't be more grateful for this staff as they've really helped to kind of fill the pieces of the puzzle um, to make those connections for us, um, to make it a smooth transition for Mrs. Bongiorno and I, but also for the students as they start a school year. So we are um, very, very grateful for them and it's just been a really great um, start in building that teamwork and um, like mindset here. So that's our theme for the year. Um, we also, obviously, because of the new administration and new staff and so forth, we felt it was really important to get everybody on board and make sure that everybody was really aware of you know, who everybody is and so that everybody feels comfortable. I think that's just normal um, for any school year to start that way, but particularly um, given the situation for this year with a total new administration. So um, we had for our seventh graders coming in the sneak preview, um, which I know that the foundation helps uh, fund which is a great opportunity for our students to be able to have that um, transition to learn how to figure out how to open up a lock, where are the classes in the building that they're attending, um, where are all the different parts of the building and how to get from one place um, and navigate those and just the basic middle school transition. Um, so you see our senators up there in their shirts, um, which uh, my young ladies here tonight are proudly wearing as eighth graders, which was great. And I think almost all of you were um, just helpers with the seventh graders this year too, right? No? Okay, maybe not. <laughs> There's a lot of kids in and out, I'm still learning. Um, so um, that was a really great success. And then um, we also felt it was important to have uh, a meet and greet opportunity for students to meet Mrs. Bongiorno and I, so we did uh, popsicles to meet the principal's event. And then we had a couple other. Uh, 
And then we also did a welcome back assembly. So you guys remember that when we did a Bulls um, thing, theme intro for all of the <coughs> staff and really just wanting to have the kids put a face to the name. And it was just lots of fun. And you see Lauren up there, Ms. Humphreys up there greeting the students. Um, and this was also an opportunity for us to really introduce ourselves to the student body and let them know like why we love and why we're here and what we're here to support them and making sure that their voices are heard and um, you know really making sure that they have that avenue coming directly to us. Um, the other thing that we did was the staff scavenger hunt, which was lots of fun, um, highlighting some of the things that we are uh, doing as a district, which is the Alice training. Um, we also talked about making sure that staff knew where AEDs were, um, so important things there for safety, but then also just some fun, greeting the students and welcoming, 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 excuse me, um, them back. I'm getting over bronchitis, so I have a lazy dog right now, so. Um, but that was lots of fun. And then just really, I think, going back to the Better Together um, theme, wanting to make sure that the staff knows that we are better together. And I think that's important for us to be able to laugh together at the beginning of the year as well, because it's going to be nitty gritty soon. <laughs> Um, we also have lots of things that we are doing with the students to increase engagement and connectedness. Um, so you'll see all of the different sports up there, including cross country, volleyball, basketball, trap, cheerleading, and wrestling, which starts up October 7th, 17th. Um, and then we have two meets, actually, so we're super excited about that. Um, Mr. Kincaid is going to be our club sponsor for wrestling. And then for intramurals, we have flag football, basketball, badminton, pickleball, disc golf, and um, volleyball as well. All right. All right. I'm going to hand it over to our girls. So our first club is Courtyard Club, and that club works a lot with student council, and we have a very beautiful courtyard in O'Neill, and this Courtyard Club works to maintain it as well as plant flowers and keep it clean. And we also host school dances there, like the Flip Flop Fling, which is the end of the year dance we have. And Courtyard Crew, Courtyard Crew works with Student Council in order to get the space ready for dances. We also have a <coughs> math club, which is run by the math teachers. And it is a club that doesn't require commitment, that meets once a month to do a fun craft after school. We also have Scholastic Bowl, which is a club that consists of students who want to do trivia, and we have meets against other schools around the area, and we start the season in January and have competitions all throughout January and February, ending the season in mid-March. One, uh, another one of the clubs we have is Student Council, which all three of us are a part of. Um, we are the ones, <coughs> along with Courtyard Crew, that work together to plan the dances, set up spirit days, and other fun things for the school. And another fun club we have is Drama Club <laughs> slash Stage Crew. Um, with Drama Club, we do improv, hang out, and just uh, learn different acting styles. And with Stage Crew, we all work together to put on a musical, which this year is Wizard of Oz. A couple more clubs that we have are Newspaper, which is a student-run, student-run newspaper run by our librarian, Mrs. Squires, which is a really great experience. Um, I know I got to do that last year, and it's been really fun so far this year as well. Uh, we actually published our next issue this coming week, um, our first issue. Um, and then also a new club thing this year is Debate Club, um, which me and one of my friends actually had the pleasure of starting. Um, which has been really cool, and we've had our one debate so far, and it's gone really well. We um, we also have yes. <coughs> this year, we also just finished up our cross country season last week um, with a huge success. Um, we had, as you can see there, um, our 8th grade girls and boys both took second place. Our 7th grade girls took third place and our 7th grade boys took fourth place. We had about 100 kids participating all season long with 65 that actually participated in the cross country conference meet. So that's a huge turnout for just two grade levels. It's, it's really remarkable on the kids. 
um, had many PRs and great successes. And it was just really great to, to see the um, camaraderie and team spirit that the kids had. So, you know, even if they weren't running in the race, many of them stayed afterwards to cheer each other on and waited at the finish line and were out spread out throughout the course to cheer each other on. So it's just really, really great to see. All right, some of the new. Um, so Lauren and I talked about some of the things that we could do to highlight students based on our school values of being safe, responsible, and respectful. And so that's done through Senator Shoutouts. And this is student to teacher, teacher to student, and peer to peer. So to date, I have distributed about 180 of these um, where kids are acknowledging all of the great things that are going on in the school and teachers are doing the same. Um, coming up to continue to recognize our senators, we have four assemblies. Um, so lots of fun to be had, so something to look forward to. Um, and then our, one of the things that we talked about doing is making sure that we are making those positive parent phone calls home so that we are building those relationships early. The next thing that we have is advisory, and just to give you kind of a schedule of how that goes, Mondays we have second step, Tuesday we do a binder check and locker clean out just to make sure that the kids are um, prepared, and then Wednesday we have the rush executive functioning lessons. Thursday we're really being intentional about some of that team building, um, camaraderie, connectiveness um, to school, so we do that Thursdays, and then Friday <coughs> is grade check, so that is where students students are accountable for what they are doing in classes from day to day. So their parents receive an email um, on how they are doing and any assignments that they need to complete, right? So we're just really kind of creating that bridge. Um, so uh, that is advisory. All right, um, unfortunately I couldn't have any of our PTA members be here tonight. They had some other equipment, or other um, things going on. but. Um, we did actually have our second meeting today um, and so they're working really hard to try and build up our membership um, but they do a number of events so I wanted to share some of those things um, as you see pictured here is the color run which is one of the fun uh, events that the kids look forward to doing at the end of the year um, they also um, do a raise craze fundraiser which we're getting started ready to uh, kick off in the next couple weeks um, where basically students are choos choosing to do you know random kind acts for other people people and then um, they're getting donations uh, for completing those um, we have the typical bread or braids fundraiser VIP days coming up in November um, and then we've been having some conversations about the eighth grade year trip and really maybe possibly changing that up um, to really kind of um, do something that gains the interest of all of our students and then um, seventh grade gets to do a trip to the King County Cougars game and then they do a number of staff appreciation activities and um, they're also going to be partnering with with us because we are putting together a fall um, dance open gym on November 8th which will be new for O'Neill this year as well so lots of fun things to partner with them about um, so I want to start off and just talking a little bit about our academic scores and where we're at um, to kind of give you a little bit of background of where we're at and where we're going so um, this would just be from last year we're talking about our reading seven um, scores uh, as you can see here you can see last year's fall math scores and then our winter and spring and reading and we were making expected growth um, which is great and we ended you know with expected growth but then if you look you can see that spring IER score which happens after that map spring test and here we have higher than expected growth which is awesome so I think as we're going through, I know there's like some concern about like math and, and where we've been, but I think there's some real great successes here and we just have to look and dig in and think about like what, what's really going on here and maybe we're gonna find some um, easy ways that we can change up and find um, better uh, ways to improve our growth overall. Um, math, uh, we had our expected growth being a little bit lower than what we had expected um, and that was consistent throughout all of our map testing but then again look at our spring IA scores higher than expected growth so that tells me right there that the teachers are doing great things in the classroom the kids are working hard but for whatever reason it's not paying off like we're not seeing that benefit in our winter and spring scores so um, we've been working with our math team to really talk about that like what is that and why is that happening and so I'll talk a little bit later on about some of the things that we're looking into to make those adjustments that hopefully we're gonna see that shift as we move through this school year 
Um, eighth grade reading, same thing here. We've got great map score in the fall. We take a little bit of just a dip because we've just got regular expected growth in the winter and spring scores, but then look at that IER spring score, huge growth there. So that's a huge success. And again, a testament to the fact that our teachers are doing some real great things in the classroom and that our students are truly learning and performing. Eighth grade math, here's where we have definitely that concern because we're seeing that yellow unexpected growth um, low, or lower than expected growth um, throughout the school year on this map scores. But then spring, they did make some improvement there on that IER, which was great. So the, again, we're doing some good things, but why isn't it paying off in that map score? So that's really what we're investigating this year and trying to be intentional about. Um, so as we move into this year, we're taking a little bit look uh, more specifically. So um, currently, right now, our fall uh, map scores for reading had a great expected growth here. Um, we're in the green, and just looking across at the map scores, we want to delve into those strands. So for reading, we're looking at informational text, literary text, and vocabulary. And as you can see there, our students are doing a great job with vocabulary. That's a good strength um, across the curriculum. I know that the building also had worked on some things with informational text and that's very apparent here too um, as the students are making a lot of gains there um, and then uh, the literary text is an area that we could probably focus in on which um, works out well because we're piloting the two new ELA curriculums so hopefully that'll address that literary text element piece as well um, so it'll be interesting to see what things look like when we get to winter in reading for grade eight, same similar things here. You see huge, great growth um, with vocabulary and our informational text seems pretty strong. Um, but we did have a little bit of a that summer slide on our expected growth for the fall. So again, we're hoping that we're gonna see some um, improvement there as we move through the school year. And then math. Again, we've got that summer slide, a little bit lower than what we expected. Um, we've got our four strands for math. So we're looking at geometry, we're looking at operations and algebraic thinking, statistics and probability, and then the real and complex number systems. So there again, you can see that we've got students doing a great job across the board in many of those areas, but we do have some work to do um, in that real and complex number systems, as well as that operations and algebraic thinking as well. Um, and in eighth grade, this was our most concern. Like, what happened here with our eighth graders? We definitely have um, maybe a summer slide, um, but they did not grow as much as we had expected them to compared to um, the other groups and, and certainly how they did in reading. So that's where we're kind of digging in a little bit further and figuring out, like, what can we do and we're, um, what, what do we need to address and how do we go about that um, as we move forward through the school year? Um, so that brings us really to our school improvement plan. Um, as I mentioned, we are working with, um, in an ELA, um, with our two piloted um, curriculums, the Amplify, and uh, we're actually getting close to wrapping that up and starting up with Common Lit soon. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how the students do, um, having now that map in that, um, those two, two different curriculum programs implemented over the last few weeks because we did our map scores right away at the beginning of the year. So they haven't, when we took our map testing, that was the like second week of school. We were starting at the end of September, uh, or sorry, the end of August, beginning of September. So they hadn't had any um, interaction with that text or with those programs. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if those programs help make a shift with stu uh, school, student achievement in those areas. Um, and then uh, our second school improvement goal is just a school-wide um, intervention for math. Um, I know that was brought up last year, so that's not something necessarily too new, um, but the building as a whole decided that they really wanted to work together to increase our MAP math scores. Um, so they put into place a map, a map, a math intervention um, for all students two days a week during their student support period. Um, and they were using Khan Academy last year. So one of the things that we looked at after looking at our fall uh, benchmark scores is, is Khan Academy the right fit? What's happening with students and how are they interacting with that program and using that um, tool to help them increase their learning? And um, we felt um, that actually looking into IXL might be a better engagement tool for students to really hone in on those areas that they have skill deficit areas. And with the IXL program, 
teachers can actually, the math teachers are actually able to go in and plug in a student's math score, which would then give the um, students like set lessons that they can work on that showed up with where their areas of deficits. So hopefully with everyone working on that, we're gonna see some of those students in all the different areas that they might have deficit areas really be working on that over the next couple months so that hopefully we'll, we'll see that improvement um, come in the winter score benchmark time. Um, and we're doing the same th similar thing with reading um, where students are working uh, with IXL in their reading, uh, working on IXL in reading during their SSP time as well. Um, in addition to the school-wide intervention that's in place, we also have small group math instruction that's happening where um, our math teachers are working with very small groups to target those skill deficit areas and work uh, using different types of programs such as Khan Academy, Math 180, Math Accelerator, IXL, and then also just looking at what are the things and content areas that um, students are struggling with and do provide any reteaching um, that they might need it as well based on how things are progressing. Um, and then uh, we're doing similar work in reading with a small, a small group reading instruction during our SSP time um, to target those skill deficit areas. And then there's also for our more intensive students that are below the 16th percentile, um, those students are in a full period of strategic reading um, every single day. So really honing in on those skill areas. Um, and then lastly, as you heard Mrs. Bongiorno talk about, we're really focusing and building wide on making sure that we are um, setting clear expectations for all of our students um, and making sure that they're following the tenets of the districts, District 58's Be Responsible, Be Respectful, um, Be Safe. So those are the things that we're working on, and so far it's been great. We've seen lots of growth. Um, we're really excited about our interventions um, and how students are going to grow, and I hope um, I'm very confident that I know that we're doing great work in the classrooms and I think with some small shifts and really looking in at what we can do to build up the excitement and motivation to get students to have more buy-in, I think we're going to see that um, winter and spring math scores um, increase to see that expected growth target or higher, ex higher than expected growth target um, be what we those colored dots that we want to see in the spring. So um, that's all I have for you. I just want to say, oops, what I heard. I just would like to say thank you so much for your support, um, letting us be here tonight, and for all the work that you do um, to let us work hard with our students um, to make them successful. So thank you. Any questions? Thank you very thank much you for being here so tonight. Much. And for our student council members, we do have some gifts for you. Thank you for being here as well. All right, listen on, tonight's <laughs> listen on tonight's agenda are eight communications received by the board. Are there any additional communications a board member would like to share at this time? <laughs> and that brings us to our spotlight. I want to welcome Huffman and Keel. Give us an update on your referendum projects. Awesome, thank you. <clears throat> Good evening, and uh, I love hearing the update on, oh, on O'Neill, because we're working on O'Neill, but uh, very exciting. Uh, <laughs> they heard they were presenting Jordan. Just that's right, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a real... <laughs> Believe me, I'm, yeah. I'm a crowd killer, all right? <laughs> my, my daughter's... Uh, in sixth grade, and so yeah, she'd probably be exiting the room too. So. <laughs> anyway, that's all right. Um, all right, happy to be here again. Jordan Schultz, Huff McKeel, Forge. Uh, we're working as the owner project management, owner project management company for the referendum projects, and so we'll be here monthly, bi-monthly, just again, you know, er early on here, very brief updates, but just have a working familiarity, and then when and as there are questions that arise during the project, uh, it'll get a little bit more intense in terms of change orders and you know updates on, on change of the project. So this will be pretty brief tonight. I'm gonna hit boom. Let's see here, one more time. There we go, perfect. All right, so real quick on design. So we're very much in the thick of design. As you can see, we've, we've gotten quite far on the middle school design. Uh, tomorrow, I'm sorry, Wednesday we have a page turn, which means simply we're taking O'Neill and 
the Herrick plans and literally sitting in a room, locking the doors and going through all the plans. 300 sheets per school, it's gonna take a little while. Uh, we, we won't hit all the sheets, but the highlights, right? We've, we've focused in at various junctures on very specific scope. Last Thursday, we're talking interior doors on the elementary schools. Other weeks, we're talking about the mechanical systems and the facade, et cetera. So this is really a time to say, hey, look, we're at this percentage complete on the plans. How are we looking? Overall, big picture. So we're gonna work on that. Uh, additionally, uh, the elementary school is about 70% 70, 70 complete. And, and those will, and again, that's just focusing on, on phase one. Phase two, those designs will not start till next year and then the following year for the, the phase two and three. In terms of bidding, uh, again, you've gotten most of these updates because you've been privy to those, or uh, you know, you've been um, approving those bid awards, but the ones that are upcoming, I'm gonna show on the next slide. And then number three, uh, AHJ, again, this is authorities having jurisdiction. We have to go through the approvals process with various entities. And it's important that we obviously get, get this early um, and so that we're, when we get responses back from some of these entities, we get responses from the design team to respond to and make any changes or tweaks that need to be made in an appropriate time so that we're not behind the eight ball when we're awarding the subs, when Bully and Andrews is awarding subs. Uh, the two items that I listed here, Village Technical Review, so that was completed. White responded last week with, with their responses. Uh, There's a couple pages worth of comments from the village that White took care of. Uh, and then sort of in tandem with this was that village, uh, or the neighborhood meeting uh, with both middle schools. And so again, positive response, no big red flags there, no big hurdles at this time. Secondly is ISBE, so there's an outsourced plan review, it's called BNF. Um, that company is basically a third party reviewer. They've provided comments to White. White will turn around those comments uh, again later this month. Uh, lastly, owner direct items. Again, this will just be sort of work that is uh, outside of White and outside of Bully and Andrews, but coordinated with both of them, i.e. environmental work that needs to be coordinated for the schools. Again, age schools have abatement items that we need to take, tackle. So there's ongoing work there. Secondly, phasing and move management. This will get more intense, so we've got another meeting coming up next week just to talk more about what does it look like to partition off parts of the school as the renovation projects begin. It's not gonna be comfortable. It's gonna be a little bit of pain, but we're gonna make it as um, you know, communicative as possible because sometimes it's kinda of like when you go to the doctor and you get the shots, like, okay, here it comes. Like, it feels a little bit more okay, uh, so we'll do that with the staff and such so that it's like, oh, I didn't know that we we're gonna have these you know, parts of the school blocked off. We're gonna have those communications with the whole project team so that there's a level of comfort with the staff and the students. And then lastly, one of the things we're getting into right now is uh, furniture. So it feels like a long way off till we need furniture, but it really will come quickly because it takes a bunch of coordination on the front end. So we'll, we'll start that RFQ process pretty shortly. In terms of overall schedule, again, just an eight month outlook. Uh, I've added onto this slide, was talking with uh, Todd a little bit, but basically putting on these, the stars to show, hey, here's where BOE comes into play at certain junctures, right? And I don't have them all covered here, but the big ones are. And so you'll be able to kind of see where you expect uh, either White or Bullion Andrews or ourselves to come back uh, for awarding various parts and pieces of, of the projects. A uh, couple items here I was gonna bring attention to. Um, I, added, I also added the little bit of orange called enabling work with the arrow in the center. Actually, this one have a laser. Yeah. Uh, so enabling work is just simply at winter time or, uh, I'm sorry, winter break or spring break to bring in a, uh, contractors to start some of that pre-work when students aren't in the classrooms so that we're ready to hit the ground running when the full-on project begins. And that is mostly tuned toward abatement work just because you can't do that or we would prefer not to do that, uh, do much of that when the students are around. Uh, and then uh, lastly, uh, again, I'm showing now in March uh, construction that was not on the, the last eight month look at, but again, it's gonna come really quickly and that feels very exciting, especially when we have uh, O'Neill and, and Herrick uh, as part of that. And then the last slide, again, nothing too exciting here. It's just the budget. Uh, again, no big changes from last time, but again, this is just a working familiarity that we'll have more detail to as the, as the project progresses. Right now there's three layers of uh, I mentioned this last time, three layers of spreadsheets that feed into this, which comes down to the invoicing level, right? We get a $5,000 invoice for a survey. Okay, it goes in there, it populates to the correct uh, line item, and we just make sure that we're tracking toward um, the budget. That's all I've got for this evening, unless there are any questions.
Questions or comments from the board? Go ahead. I have uh, <clears throat> two questions. First, uh, when we talk about parts of the building being sectioned off, obviously for construction purposes, can you give us a sense for what are the big phases where components of the building will be unusable? And maybe, Kevin, you can chime in on how are we going to work with the building team to plan for contingencies during that time? Yeah, so uh, I'll talk to Jordan if you want to jump in. I'm going to give you an example. Um, Sorry about that. O'Neill oh, Middle School is a great example. So as we go into spring break, one of the things that we want to start doing besides the exterior work is to take a look at, at some of those science labs. And so um, what that's going to require, though, is two of our current math teachers who are in the hallway um, uh, where the math rooms are will move to other rooms in the school. And we've identified that O'Neill can um, handle the extra space because that building is currently underutilized and so we're able to make that change and then start that construction to avoid delays. What we'll do is, um, and we've already given the staff that, uh, you know, we've had conversations that that's coming down the pike, um, but as we get closer to that, Justin will actually sit down with Lauren and Danielle and the impacted staff and go over a plan and, and really detail all of that. That work has begun, but Justin, again, as um, head of personnel, We'll go and have those conversations. Um, when we look at Herrick, one of the biggest changes that we know will happen is as we start to work on the exterior, so that big field that is um, towards Saratoga Avenue, that current exterior, we're going to have to close up those windows and, and actually board a lot of those over so they don't get damaged during construction, right? Um, when you lose the ability to open windows, then we have to bring in um, air filtration and be able to make sure that they have the proper heat and the, the proper cooling in those particular spaces. And so that is something we've already talked with the Herrick staff that that's coming down the road. As we get closer to that, again, Justin will meet with all those impacted staff members and we'll go through that. If there are situations where, you know, we anticipate in year two, and this is anticipated because nothing's final, where we actually now are saying some of these hallways aren't going to be accessible, um, that is a, you know, a, a multi-pronged uh, conversation that we have. First, we have it with um, the staff, then we have it with the students, then we'll have it with the families and really explain to them what's going on in the process. Another great example of that where we'll be involving students is when we start construction on the middle school locker rooms. Students aren't going to be able to change for PE, so it'll be more like what we do at the elementary school where they're going to PE, but we're going to have to communicate that out to families when that's going to happen, how that's going to happen, what are suggested clothing items to wear to school because you will be doing PE and uh, your general education classroom. So again, we've got a really good system in place with Huffman and Keel about when are these milestones coming, when do we need to start having conversations with staff members, and then we've been having conversations um, you know, at the 50,000 foot level with the staff the principals were getting a little bit more into the weeds, and then we'll go have a conversation with the staff members. But we are planning this as we go through. Um, some changes will be small, won't impact kids all that much, where other changes like the locker rooms will certainly be bigger, and uh, we're gonna have to have more detailed conversations and plans with them as we go through. And all that is part of the process that we've got mapped out. Yeah. Can I get most of it, Jordan? You covered it way better than I could have, but, but yeah, no, it's, I, I think that's just it is, it's the communication of those different layers of like, hey, we start really high level and then, you know, we get into the weeds in terms of as we get closer to those times and then even during that phasing, it'll be simply communicating, actually, you know what, we need to make, take another 10 feet of this hallway because we need to take out this floor tile and it actually makes sense to, and so those are the conversations that are starting now in, in the construction trailer, i.e. at the district office, and then those will cascade down as we get closer to construction. But it'll be communicating things like, what does that look like? What does a temporary partition look like, right? Drywall, plastic, all that sort of thing. So that people are like, oh, okay, here's what's in you know, locker rooms, right? It's not accessible, it's, you know, it's gonna be blocked off, it's gonna look like this. Um, are there gonna be particular areas where the ceiling is out, right? For a week you know, after uh, a break, right? Um, what does that look like? What's the level of acceptability to it? Um, are there exposed concrete floors that, again, you know, you, you, the, the floor tile had to come up in this phase, but now the new tile is not going down, you know, for this period of time. So just communicating things like that, and those are just general examples. But um, again, as long as people are comfortable and kind of know it's coming, and that there's a really great thing at the end, uh, it makes it a lot more toler tolerable and a lot less sort of like squeaky wheel we're worried about this because there's an excitement for the future. And just to piggyback off of that, one of the things our staff have asked us is to obviously give them the heads up when they have to move, how do we assist them with moving things from point A to point B, and how do we make sure that no matter what space our kids are in, that they're still getting that high quality instruction. And so those are the conversations that we're having now. And if we can't guarantee, like let's say we're gonna move teacher A to room B, 
if we can't guarantee that that instruction can continue in that you know uh, manner that we expect it to then we'll hold off on that project until the summer so what we're trying to do during the school year are those minimal projects that won't disrupt things um, to the point where we're taking away from our standard of learning and then some of those areas though like locker rooms are obviously an exception to that we have to be able to, to do some of uh, that work but we've also spent a lot of time talking with our partners in 99 about how they manage some of these things because they had students in the building as they were going through I think many of us can remember being over at South for the uh, COVID-19 clinic and watching how all of that really went through it and spending a lot of time talking with them what we're really also going to rely heavily on are the site superintendents for the construction project to, be, uh, to really be our um, people on the ground to talk to us about, you can expect this, this is on schedule, this is what we're doing. So a lot of front load on the planning, but having several conversations and communicating it out several different ways so everybody understands the plan when we get there. I have just a note on that uh, mm -hmm. phasing and moving. You mentioned the outdoor at Herrick being const work construction being worked out on that and I'm sure it's already on the list but um, and it's probably all going to happen mostly in the summer but that is where they hold gym class and there's like a hundred plus yeah. kids out there it's every great, day every period great question and it's their only time outside so, yeah, so we're going to continue to get I'm kids sure outside we've actually already talked about it would be a little longer walk to get to the field mm -hmm. but how do we still again that goes back to how do we keep that high quality of education and getting kids outside for pee is important mm -hmm. and so because we have so many limits to that during the school year with weather we do want to get the kids outside and so we've actually mapped out what that exit will look like if you can't go out this door how does that work and, and go all the way around the building access. and then talking about um, you know using things like snow fences to make sure that we get the kids where they need to be but certainly that is a conversation even if they can't change into their key uniform how do we still make sure the kids get outside and are able to move around and participate um, we are also working on contingency plans for our athletic teams because mm -hmm. they still have to change for their games and everything. And what is that going to look like? What area of the school are we going to utilize for those things? So those are all ongoing conversations that we're having right now. I think the, the children may enjoy for a while not changing for PE, but we are getting back to changing for PE soon. I'm sure there are, are some eighth graders that maybe are not so excited about yes. <laughs> first period gym class in Correct. 80 degrees in their clothes all day. Correct. But again, we are trying to but make school okay. as normal as yeah. possible um, during the construction process because the students who are living through construction are only going to get seventh grade once. They're only going to get eighth grade yeah. once. And so how do we yeah. hold true to that? Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just had a question. Um, I guess Dr. Russell, you mentioned systems. And you also mentioned that there's no red flags at this point in time. Mm -hmm. I guess, can you maybe just talk about how you see risk management and what would you say are the top risks for each of those? You know, we've got the middle schools and then the elementary schools in 2024. Mm -hmm. How would you kind of describe the risk management process and how like those risks would be communicated and escalated to the Board of Education. Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, at the sort of um, non-student impact, you know, there's obviously the, okay, budget and schedule, right? Those are, you know, why we're here and why we're working closely together with, with the whole district's team um, and, and the construction design partners. On the sort of risk student staff wise, I think it's kind of more what you're talking about, but there's a whole chain of command or, or chain of responsiveness that Bully and Andrews will have put together. And, and again, um, Dr. Russell's talked about like the superintendent, right? Bully and Andrews has superintendents that are familiar with working in schools. And so they know, look, these are some of the protocols safety-wise that have to be taken care of. Uh, so that students and staff are absolutely as safe as possible at all times, even though there's construction going on right adjacent, right? Uh, and then there's this whole thread of, okay, if, you know, if something happens of X level of severity, here's how the um, communication goes out, right? And so that hasn't been assembled yet. Um, and so, uh, again, they'll update the form in terms of, okay, here's who needs to be notified and when and how, um, so that any types of risk in terms of construction uh, are mitigated. Yeah. And, and I guess I would just say, as that gets built out, that'd be something that I'd be interested in, kind of seeing what that, that yeah. escalation mm -hmm. process looks like. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and again, that is why we recommended um, Bully and Andrews and Huffman and Keel because of their experience working through these types of projects to be able to say that. And if there is any concern, you know, obviously on the safety thing, the board will know right away. On the other side of risk management in terms of schedule and budget, if we see something that could be off, um, the board will know that right away as well because 
we would use the board to come back and say, you know, we're over budget, and so here are the things that we don't think we should do. Do you agree or not? And we would definitely come back to the board. I think right now, um, while we're only at the 70 to 75 percent um, substantial completion rate, things are still looking very good. But certainly, I think my, if you were to ask me what's keeping you up at night right now, staying on schedule and staying on budget. Um, just like we shared when we did the uh, big mechanical bids, when you're looking at 45 week lead times, that certainly is a concern uh, that I know we talk about all of the time. What does that look like? Yeah. Um, if they do come in on time, what does it look like if they don't come in on time because it's a tight window all the way around? So um, that's just one example how we're working through with Bully and Andrews and Huffman and Kill. Okay, if these chillers don't come in on time, what is our backup plan to make sure we still provide the cooling? If they do come in on time and we only have three or four weeks to get them in, what does that look like? And so th those are the things that we're doing. But really right now, we didn't see any red flags in terms of the neighborhood meetings about moving forward from the State Board of Education about the overall design, so I think we're in really good shape there. I think the lead times are um, a warning sign. I wouldn't call them a red flag yet, but we knew that no matter what we were ordering in this process, we were going to run up into some, some pretty tight um, schedules. And, and so that right now, I think, is the one area that we're really focusing in on. So if yeah. we actually go back to the previous slide, I guess, which bars would we kind of say are the ones keeping us up at night? Well, and, and I guess even to piggyback, uh, so I, yeah, no, it's a good, it's a good question. So under elementary schools, you'll see where it says LL unit ventilators. So that's long lead unit ventilators. So previously there was not a bid package, a separate bid package for those. Um, but our, you know, again, the, the district's partner, you know, Bully and Andrew said, hey, these are actually going to be a longer lead time than we originally anticipated two or three months ago when we were talking about it. Can we do this, right? So White adjusts with their team. They put together a different package. So they've updated their schedule to then have uh, this separate process of, of releasing the design for the unit ventilators so that the, the lead time, and it might be 45 weeks. I don't know, unit ventilators off the top of my head right now, but um, whatever it was, you know, bullying just flagged that, for example, and said, hey, we got a, an issue here. Another one would be um, utility company, right? We're in constant communication every week with ComEd mm -hmm. um, just to say, hey, because again, the, there's an, a certain notoriety to dealing with utilities because they just have, it's a big behemoth, right? And so the last thing we need is to be ready to turn the, you know, to pr turn the power on for the new service and it's not ready because, because ComEd hasn't finished putting the new transformer or something, right? Um, so again, it's just having that constant communication with them uh, as long as, as well as with the design and construction team. So there's a lot of, I mean, it's hard to put in sort of one checklist of like, here's, you know, because just so many different parts and pieces. So when it comes to lead times, we're really leaning in Bully and Andrews. When it comes to utilities, it's kind of falling on us along with okay. White, right? Um, and so there's all these little different buckets, which is why we have all these weekly meetings where it's like, hey, anything arose this past week that you have to bring up to the table. Um, again, it's all these issues, right? So, you know, another example, Wednesday morning this week, we'll have a meeting with regard to soils, right? Hey, the soils report says you have this structural bearing capacity. How do we <coughs> best manage that cost-wise, schedule-wise, right? Okay, what do we do and how do we pivot from there? Um, again, nothing that's unanticipated at this time. It's, it's part of the you know, design and the structure. It's just a matter of best solution for that particular thing. Um, so there's a million examples of, of things like that that head off the risk at various junctures. And, and, and like you said, I mean, we're going to be here to raise those flags and say, hey, guys, <coughs> these unit, unit ventilators weren't ordered on time. Now they will be, thankfully. But had they not been, right, we have a concern of not having air conditioning in September or something, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we'd, we'd address that. All right, just kind of another question. Uh, if we look at these six buildings, which which one kind of keeps you up at night versus the others? <laughs> I'll answer that. Yeah. <laughs> Whittier, just because of the age. I think when you look at Whittier mm -hmm. and you look at trying to maintain in the older section some of that old feel to it, but also, you know, with things like abatement projects that you, know, you don't know until you start opening up everything, um, some of the old cloth wiring, those are the things that um, what would keep me up more as the superintendent. But again, I, I hope what we're demonstrating to the board through Huffman and Keel and Bully and Andrews is just how actively engaged all of us are in this process. And I think the more people you get in the room, 
looking at things from a different lens, whether it's White from Design or Bullying Andrews from Schedule, Huffman and Keel, kind of watching all of it, and then the admin team there, um, really just having these good conversations and pushing each other. Uh, it, it's a really good group. Uh, we're working very hard every Thursday to, to avoid some of these things, but you know, that was a conversation we had the other day about uh, Whittier. We knew Whittier, what was going to be, you know, the building was built in 1928, I believe, and so it's gonna present some challenges when you go through. Thank, thank you. Yep. I had a question about budget. Uh, Kevin, you started to speak to this, but mm -hmm. I, what, I guess what I, I'll name what I'm looking for, and you all can tell me if I should be able to see it here or if it's somewhere else. What I'm looking for is budget to plan, right? So we're, we are in October of 2023. We expected to have spent $7.7 .7 million mm -hmm. as a random number. Mm -hmm. We've actually spent 8.3. Help us understand why we're over budget by 600K. Uh, that's something that I don't, I don't know if I see here, and I'm wondering if that exists, and if so, can we start to get numbers like that so we can see how we're tracking against planned budget? Yeah, so it's a little bit of a, an art and a science. So right now, what we'll do is, at some point very shortly, is draw a line in sand in that budget column, right? So that budget column will stay fixed at that point. And it'll say, okay, you know, uh, right now we've got 179.3 for construction, right? very shortly we're just going to say okay we're, we're far enough along we feel confident this is where we're fixing it and then af after that it'll track uh, as a variance in that second column of final projected cost to say okay you know what um, we're going to have to add some more owner contingent you know the pull some from the, the lower line of owner contingency up to construction because you know what we realize we should probably buy an extra whatever that thing is right um, or, or there was an issue discovered because of the soil condition or something, right? And so that second column of final projected cost, that's the one that will start to move, but the first will stay fixed. Um, again, the plan right now, right, is for the bottom line to remain fixed um, and that the owner contingency line is the variable, right? So we need to add something more to the construction line item or to the professional services. Um, and so that's where the variance uh, sits. In terms of like a cash flow variance, we sometimes will do that, um, but usually it's more of a snapshot. So it'll be along the line, you know, with, with uh, Todd, the conversation will be, hey, can you update the cash flow, right? We thought we'd spend, uh, again, not, not, um, not a projection, but in real time, we thought we would have spent $10 million worth of construction in March and April of this year. You guys only spent five million, tell me more, right? Because they're, he's gonna have to communicate back to all, you know, the, the, uh, the financial committee uh, what that variation has been. Um, because sometimes, you know, if you're investing bond interest money or something like that, right? Um, so we, we do that, but it's more of a snapshot rather than sort of a vari variance bar, um, graph. Does that make I sense? Think it, I think I'll have to like look at this mm -hmm. slide in a different way. Yep. And if <clears throat> I guess what I'm looking for is how will we know in a given month that we are mm -hmm. tracking against budget in the positive or in the negative? Sure, because sure. This $209 million balance seems really large today, yep. but I'm guessing in about mm -hmm. nine months it's going to feel really small. Well, it's, I was going to answer that in a couple of different ways to kind of piggyback off of Jordan. So one of the things that we also have, this is obviously the highest level summary you can get. Right. Then we have it broken down by site. Then we have inside of each site budget broken down. And, and I think we shared that with the board back in August in terms of, you know, if, if Whittier's the 16 million, I'm making this up off the top of my head. If Whittier's the $16 million project, how much are we spending on HVAC? Where are we at? Mm -hmm. So you're going to get those. The other, or, or we can continue to share those numbers with you. The other thing is we have to do a second issuance for bonds because we don't borrow all the money at once, right? When we do that second issuance is how are we on track with our finances? Are we spending what we thought we would be? And when do we plan on going up for that? So that is something that the FAC will also be reviewing as we go through this just to make sure that we're on track. But to get you what you're at, what, what you're asking for, Karath, we would have to go back into all the different sites and say, okay, um, by the fall of 2024, we expect Whittier, Hillcrest, Highland, and um, Henry Puffer to be complete. So we should be through this amount of money at that particular time. So we're tracking that to make sure because then that triggers when we have to go out for the bond issuance again. And so all that is being tracked internally. It's not shown on this because it's such a high level and because we have 13 different sites. 
but certainly we can continue to dialogue and get the board any information they need that um, they find helpful and useful to make those decisions. But yep. our milestones are when is that project completion date, are we staying on budget with the designs, and how much of that money have we spent um, when we go out to, to bid and, and start um, you know, putting that money in, in others' pockets. So we can talk about what that can look like. I'd like to see some examples, Jordan, that you use yep. for other districts on a monthly basis and we can get back and, and kind of share some examples and see if that's what you're looking for. Yeah, yeah and I think to piggyback on that, I think the, uh, the primary driver of cost obviously is construction, right? So there's two buckets that really are the, the variable piece, right? So we're going to go out for a bid later this month uh, for the middle schools, sort of the bulk of those packages. Um, and once we progress through that package and the following package, then we set we have that sum, right? For the for X middle school, it's going to be sixty million, and um, and then from that point, there's going to be two pieces, right? There's the con contractor contingency. So within Bully and Andrew's number is going to be their uh, um, contractor controlled contingency, and so what we can show and what we've done before, and we can provide some examples is okay. Here's your base number. Here's what we, here's what Bully and Andrews has spent of, the, of their contingency to address issues in the in the field, and then here's the owner contingency. Now, right now, we're just putting it as a lump sum owner contingency, and we can have a further discussion as to do you really allocate that per school? Not usually, because you don't want you know, like we talked about, Whittier is just going to be a little bit more money. It's just because of its of its age and such. Um, so, do you really? want to nickel and dime and say, well, you know what, we really can't spend any more money on that school because it wouldn't be, you know, exactly what we're spending at the other, right? So as we spend the contractor contingency and the owner contingency, what we're looking for is a general trend toward a proportion, a proportion, right? So if we're getting more than, uh, I think we're at 10% right now, uh, I'm sorry, I forget the exact percentage of the two different uh, contingencies, but if we're trending s slightly higher than that, slightly lower than that, totally fine. If we're trending much outside of that, that's when we get concerned to say, you know what, we really only have 10% to, to spend on here, and right now we're trending much higher. Uh, we're going to ha have to have a discussion if this is going to cost you know, future phases, because that's what we're very sensitive to is <laughs> don't use up the $10 million of contingency on the first phase, and you have nothing left for phase mm -hmm. two and three. Um, so, so that breakdown of the contractor contingency and the owner contingency, I think, contingency, I think is sort of my punchline. I, I would say is when we when we start to show that on here uh, per school, um, if we want to show that every month, then we can do that. But that's what we'll be tracking internally along with the construction team. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. And my question was, you know, we want to make sure we have seven schools and two other phases. So, yep. uh, you know, I think part of it is also knowing right that that money set aside for those seven schools, you're not going to dip in and, and then those schools in phase three wind up you right. know, cutting some corn, right? Yes. That everything is definitely planned out very well. And yep. yeah, I think that the way that this is presented right now, I'm, I'm with member Doshi on this one, is it's very high level and it's really just a percentage of completion of total budget versus, right. you know, where are we in perspective of where we should be. Yep. Yep. Um, and that, and that, again, maybe what I can do next time is sort of show the next layer deep, um, mm -hmm. or maybe even repackage it just so it's not so exhausting with you know three dozen line items. But yeah. a, a slightly in between version might be There's helpful. There's a happy medium. There's a happy medium, There's yeah. A happy medium uh, there. Just so that, so that I, I get, I see, I hear what you're getting at, um, and I think showing something like that as we get closer to construction and sort of a, a um, one of the models that we've used for that, I think would be helpful. Just because, again. When it's two schools or three schools, it's a little bit of a different ball game. When we do things like this, where it's six, ten schools, in this case, thirteen, uh, it does get a little bit like, okay, how do you visualize that, right? Three phases, mm -hmm. you know, so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I think it's tough in, in this form, right? This is this is very high level, but I think you know one thing we want to do just to make sure that this this project is very large. It's very you know we want it to be successful. So I think we want to trust and verify. So we do want to see that. Mm -hmm. next few layers so yep. I don't know if we want to utilize the the weekly updates to kind of give a glimpse sure. to kind of appreciate th those next few levels yeah. and then because I'm not saying that we need to change like this level of detail for the board but I think we do need to trust and verify that yep. that yep. information is there if, if we need it I think it's the perfect time to have the conversation before we get into really you know that spending mm -hmm. over and over again so um, yeah some of that information came as like a memo yeah then we don't expect you to have to do a big 
yeah. long presentation at the time. Right. But then if we catch something <laughs> yep. on the document, yeah. then, that'd, that'd then be perfect. You, you see the same document, we can come in and, and ask yep. a question like, this anomaly looks strange to us, and you might go, yeah, no, if everybody's having that problem because X, Y, or Z is happening. Sure. And then, and then uh, so I, I think that would be helpful. I don't know that you have to change your yep. presentation, per se, but if we have to get in front of us prior to the, the ninth, and we're prepared to ask them. That's a good, no, I think that's a great, yeah. a great approach. And we'll keep that. checking in with, with uh, the board, too, to make sure that we're getting the format. I think the worst thing that we can do is provide you, you know, a summary that we think you're asking for rather than, you know, show you what you really need. And, and so we'll keep, you know, sharing examples with you until we get it right. Well, it might look different as we go along. Right. This initial phase where we're still planning and doing all yeah. that may look very different than, what, you know, when the hammers are out and, and we're actually uh, building, right? So, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. yeah, we have, we have a, um, Something that we call a dashboard, so that might be you know let's go over that. Um, but it's nice to have one pager, and it shows sort of various components rather than slide form. It's just something you can look at. It's too much information to put on a slide, but if you look at it ahead of time, then you can digest it, then come with questions where it's like, hey, we saw this thing, like you said. Um, you that. Any other questions or comments? All right. Thank you very much for being here tonight, Thank Jordan. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. All right. We have a second spotlight tonight, so. Liz Earhart, welcome up <laughs> to our fall data snapshot. Good evening, board. So I am going to go through our fall data snapshot with you. Tonight's objectives are to provide a district-level overview of our fall 2023 benchmarking data through our district ECRA reports and provide the board a preview of the information that will be examined in further detail at the next several Board of Education meetings. So when we take a look at our overall initial fall data impressions, we have some considerations we want the board um, to take. Fall data is gathered with the furthest distance from in-school instruction. Fall data is reviewed to monitor growth expectations. And the um, fall growth summaries are based upon students' individual projections, which are based upon their propensity score calculated by ECRA. ECRA saw a leveling off of projections this fall, returning to more typical growth scores that they saw pre-pandemic. And fifth grade students, as we review the data in mathematics, who are accelerated to our sixth and seventh grade classes, are not reflected in the fifth grade math data set as they take the six plus math math test. So it's just some things that we want to um, take into consideration as we review this data. ECRA uses fall as a check in on student progress towards reaching their projected score, which is based on um, spring of 2023 data. ECRA uses a student's last three data points as they're determining that projection. And we saw some high growth patterns last spring, which is something that um, is certainly something we want to celebrate for all of our students. But it did set um, many students' targets on a higher trajectory this year, which is great news. Some initial observations in the data as we review through some of the slides. Fall data is within the expected growth rate in both reading and math with reading slightly higher. So 82% of students in high, um, high or expected growth in reading, 77% of our students in higher expected growth in math. Middle school um, was lower than expected in this data set um, and all student groups made their expected growth within um, with the exception of our female population in math um, and only slightly. We will now review data images from our ECHO reports and take a deeper dive into this data. Ooh, of course I went backwards, I apologize. <laughs> All right, so just a few things to remember as we look at our ECRA growth reports. This is um, a, a visual from ECRA which shows that we start with taking last year's performance on universally administered tests, which um, when we're comparing our fall data, it's our MAP test um, or our MAP assessment. Then we look at individual student composite achievement scores, which is their propensity score. They project future scores for fall, winter, and spring. Then we receive the students' actual scores in fall, winter, and spring, and that's where we determine what growth was made. Just a reminder as we review some of our ECRA information that we're looking at growth scores and effect size. So our growth scores represent the magnitude of difference between an actual and expected achievement. So every deviation from zero indicates more or less than expected growth, and that is what we will be reviewing today. 
For groups of students, the following two conditions must be met in order for a growth score to be deemed statistically significant. So the difference between projected and actual achievement is, is statistically significant, and then um, the magnitude of that growth statistic is greater than or equal to an absolute value of 0 0.3, which is educationally um, a relevant effect size. So again, just a visual from ECRA. When we're looking at our chart, we see our um, green dot, or I'm sorry, our green dot is expected growth. That's that growth from um, negative 0 0.29 to positive 0 0.29. Anything above that um, positive 0 0.29 is higher than expected. Anything lower will be represented in yellow. And then if we are below 0 .0, 0 .0, I'm sorry, 0 0.6, um, that is considered unsatisfactory growth, but again, we just want to remember that we're looking at this as a continuum of um, presentation of data. When we review our fall data through a formative lens, we reflect on how our fall data presents. While not to over-celebrate um, or over-criticize these data points, they really truly are a snapshot of our student learning and kind of drives what we do um, to best support our students in the classroom. Our data is a tool that allows us to review and adjust practices when we see lower than expected growth, while also looking for ways to replicate our successes in classrooms when we see higher than expected growth. We use this tool to help guide our school improvement process and many of the um, buildings are finalizing those plans um, as we speak. They'll be completed by the end of the month. So again, just looking at that fall growth summary, we um, base this information on our NWEA map of growth assessment in both reading and math in grades one through eight. As we, um, and that in grades K and one, or in this case, just one, we use our Ames Web early numeracy and early literacy scores. Our fall growth summary is based on students who attended Downers Grove District 58 last year and have three data points to determine those propensity scores for the school year. So when we look at all subjects, we reached expected growth um, as an overall district, while seeing that within our middle schools, we do still see some slight variances of lower than expected growth. Our overall growth in mathematics was within expected range. Again, that's that top number. While we did see below average growth in both of our middle schools, which is consistent with what we saw last fall, but knowing that achievement remains high at all grade levels. This shows that we want to continue to build on our work with our middle school math departments, increasing their instructional toolboxes, providing um, ped pedagogical modes to move the needle in terms of students staying on target to meet those growth targets. So it's really important that we are taking this as, again, a data snapshot and really making some um, determinations of what we can do to improve um, that growth score at both middle schools. We see similar progress in reading where most schools are within accepted growth with just Herrick missing that benchmark by one hundredth of a point in terms of um, effect size. So they were right at that expected growth, they just fell short of that. Um, when we look at um, when we look at our reading, right now we're seeing um, reading as, as higher um, than expected growth or expected growth versus where our math scores are. When we look at this across grade levels versus by school, um, this year we were able to include first and second grade into our data review as we had data points available to set propensity and projected scores. So we notice our upper elementary and middle school growth showing some disparities, while fifth grade, that's where that star is, is where we see that smaller um, student count because of our students who take sixth and seventh grade math at fifth grade not being represented in this data pool. Then we saw higher than expected growth at our sixth grade level in mathematics, and then again, um, our middle school showing lower than expected growth. In reading, all grades made expected growth except eighth grade, which was lower than expected. Again, with the overall being um, within the expected growth range. When we take a look at our student groups, all but our female student group made their expected growth target in mathematics, with our female subgroup missing expected growth by five hundredths of a point in terms of effect size. So again, right, right near that mark. Can I ask a question about this? Yeah, of course. We've seen these slides a bit, and yeah. something is occurring to me that uh, when we think about subgroups in particular, yeah. 
Uh, so, so there's something about expected growth being based off of historical data, yeah. right? And mm -hmm. the historical data being, in essence, way, the way that we've performed as a district yeah. uh, in the past. And expected growth is repeating what we've, how we've performed in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, if I, and this is me like checking the definition, if that's accurate. Mm -hmm. If that's accurate, then for particular subgroups that have historically underperformed mm -hmm. in the past, yeah. Seeing green feels like an underachievement, right? Like we need to be achieving higher than expected growth in order for us to be closing achievement gaps. Is that the right way for me to interpret this data or am I missing something? I think what we want to make sure that we're recognizing is that when we look at subgroups, they're going to give us different um, trajectories of, of where that um, data is, is going in terms of from fall to spring or spring to spring. And so we're recognizing that these subgroups are hitting those targets. Um, of course, you know, when we, when we look at it in a color-coded type of way, we want to see all of our greens and blues, um, but really showing that our subgroups right now are hitting in that expected um, growth target. It's something that we can continue to monitor as we move into winter to make sure that we're continuing that trajectory. Kira, yeah. though, mm -hmm. I would piggyback off what Liz said. So as you're looking at this, if your question is, how do you close the achievement gap? I think you do it in two ways. The first, you, you have to meet the target that is set for yourself, which is where you see the green. The, you will close the achievement gap greater though, the more blue you could get in this case because you're outpacing your growth, right? And so, I, you know, one of the other things that we don't just look at is growth in isolation. We're also looking at the achievement, right? And so for instance, when we look at the eighth graders this year in mathematics, and they achieved at the 88th percentile. Last <coughs> fall, when they were seventh graders, they were also at the 88th percentile. So what we saw there was they maintained their percentile, but their growth wasn't as high because we would want to see that percentile increase, right? And so we're looking at, you know, we have to look at the achievement percentile as well to see how is that achievement gap closing or is it staying stagnant? Um, mm -hmm. But I hope I'm making sense with that. Um, so. Yes, sometimes you need to see blue to see maybe it, it close more, but just because you see green, don't assume that that gap isn't, isn't closing. If you see yellow or red, then yes, we're kind of going in the wrong direction there. We've got to change that trend. So green means we're on track for that. Blue means you're really hitting it out of the park in that particular area. But again, you've got to verify that with your overall achievement percentile to see where you're at. So when we look at the uh, actual map report, one of the things that I look at is the school conditional growth and so does our team to see how are we comparing to schools that start off at the same rate, are we closing that achievement gap or are we not? And so we're looking for in the school conditional growth index a number higher than the 50th percentile because that shows that we're beating schools that start with the same rate. So kind of looking at both. So um, to answer your question, come full circle, um, you are correct that if you are in the blue, you're really closing that achievement gap, but green also can mean that you're closing it, just maybe not at that high rate. Well, and additionally, one thing that I do just want to comment on is right now we are looking at specifically a growth summary um, from where our trajectory is from spring of last year to spring of this year. We're going to kind of close the circle of data in our next two meetings looking at some achievement data from last spring and looking at those final reports once the school report card is released. So there, there's kind of a, a step that, you know, we'll, we'll cross as, as we've kind of wrap up our data from last school year. That's a really good point. Yeah. yeah. I also know that this is the first time that you're presenting to us, but yeah. to, to go along with what Member Doshi uh, was, was, was talking about, and my guess is Member Olchek would be uh, ready to, to make the same comment, is that one of the conversations that we've been having over right. the last couple of years is that our low achieving, one of the reasons why we moved to the growth model, mm -hmm. we really wanted to kind of focus on that, was um, if you have high achieving groups, like, and you can just sit here and celebrate all day, but are we actually teaching kids? And then and how do we in our the groups world? that are not, are we making a difference? So if they come to us in third grade reading at a kindergarten level, sure. are we growing them? And, and, and our thought was the growth in, in our, any at-risk kid that, that's coming in and, and underachieving is, is we really were trying to set a goal for ourselves of dipping into that blue. And if not blue, when you're in the green, being on the positive side of that, mm -hmm. um, you know, the differential, that differential words, you know, sure. Yeah, and so I, 
I think ultimately, and I know it's weirder when we talk about fall data than when we get sure. to the end of the year, yeah. but I know that one of the things that we want to make sure that we're doing, especially is we've got more and more students coming in that have higher levels of need needs, um, sure. or are, are falling below the benchmark. Mm -hmm. How do we, um, we may not be able to in the couple of years that we have them, get them all the way to grade level, but how do we work really hard to be getting 150% of that growth and how, what right. kind of plans can we put into place? And now that we have this data and we've had it for a little while, I think, am I kind of getting what the point that you're Yeah, you're hitting it on the head. Mm -hmm. I think that, that th we're at this phase now where we are starting to get comfortable with this type of reporting. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And I think we allowed ourselves the year to like start to get comfortable with it. And I think we're there. And now we're starting to talk about now how is this data working for us? Right. Uh, and so that's, that's what I'm looking for is to see how are we, when I look at my, our, our subgroups, right? Our yeah. ELL students, our black students, our low income students, 15, 16%, 16% and 15% have met benchmark. Mm -hmm. The green dots are based on historical performance of those same subgroups, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Right, And so those subgroups are performing at the levels at which we have seen in historical data. And, and for me, I'm not that. celebrating greens for those subgroups because the mm -hmm. greens for those subgroups tell me that we are serving them just as well as we served them in 2019, 2020, 2021, and so on. Uh, and this is, it. it and this is this is on all of us, right? This is on all of us as a school district mm -hmm. to think about how are we taking the best practices to be able to bring achievement up and growth up to a level at which we can all celebrate. Yeah. yeah well, the the only thing I would respect <coughs> and push back a, a little bit. Um, I don't think we should ever look at green and say we're not doing what we should. So when when you look at um, the 18 19 20 all this is historical right and so when I, when i interpret the green as you know are we making a year's worth of growth for each student right and so i think that is a a really positive thing i also understand what what you guys are you know looking for in saying you know we want to close achievement gap so how do we get even further past that right um, but to get the green that does mean we're making a year's worth of growth is for that, each that was my clarifying question mm -hmm. Is that what that green is saying? Or is it saying that we are achieving the growth of that pa as that population would have demonstrated in previous years? No, no, no. In order to hit green, you have to be on the trajectory. Make growth. You have to be on where they're projecting you to go based on your prior score. Based on your prior score, right. not based on an annual growth. And yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> does, it, does my clarifying question make sense? <laughs> I, and, and our I, district norms as well. And, and, and the one thing I would say that, that, that Necker says about the, the models it is like subgroup agnostic. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the one like, thing that you might, we might want to like dive in on this probably, like, maybe a little bit too much to do right now, but I think their model in itself is based on historical data for students. And, and, and John Gott will make a point to say it doesn't, they don't look at subgroups. They look at the, 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 the six assessments that you took that year, and that's what creates that one. Score. And that's what drives all the expected growth targets this year based on our historical data. So it, it doesn't it, it doesn't factor in that that green signal doesn't factor in <coughs> so but, but I mean to your point and that you in the visual of the, the, the river, right? The student is, if the student is below uh, you know below fifty fifty percent of the achievement respected, probably not gonna get above it unless unless it starts to really and I, I think I think Yes. That that part is, I would agree with. It. Uh, I, I think the, the subgroup part is a nuance that I think is a little bit different about the model. Yeah, I think the well, subgroup is just a good example of some of our some of our. This is an opportunity for us to look at some of these numbers yeah. are lower achieving, and so I think we're generically talking about are there opportunities to take our lower achieving yeah. students. I don't care necessarily what subgroup you're in or why. You, what I care about, I think, what we care about here is if we have kids that are underachieving. How do we find opportunities to yeah. expedite yeah. growth? And, yes. and I think a lot of the conversations that the teachers are having in their tier one meetings <coughs> about what they can do within the classroom, they're looking at their ECRA data and you know, diagnosing through through the numbers and, and through the reports that they're looking at um, and making some determinations about what they can do within their classrooms, as well as what supports and interventions are we putting in place for uh, you know, some typically um, underperforming um, students and how can we best serve them? The other point I want to make about the, the data that you're seeing here, um, you're only seeing MAP primarily, right. and then you're also mm -hmm. seeing um, you know, a little bit of Ames Lab for our, for our first grade. This is 
very similar to data you would have seen last spring because we, we give that in May and then kids go home for the summer and then as soon as they get back we give them the <coughs> map assessment. So what we like about the fall assessment, previous years we weren't doing the fall assessment. Now we have consistently given the fall assessment mm -hmm. is it helps us as we sit down at the beginning of the year saying, okay, did this help corroborate what we had in the spring? Are we on the right track for each one of these individual kids? Um, and how bad was that summer slide if there was one? And so then we make the adjustments moving forward. I think the other thing that we're seeing with our data in particular is that our IAR data is much stronger and tells a different story than our map data. So when you see that come in, you are gonna see a lot more different colors <laughs> sprinkled in there. And so trying to differentiate, that's one of the things that we're currently doing is, and I think you heard Lauren allude to it, what is the difference between map and IAR? Because we are starting to see a lot of really good gains on IAR, still seeing the expected growth on map, but not seeing as bigger gains that we're seeing on that assessment. So again, really diving into uh, that. I don't want to get too far in the weeds, but eighth grade math is a good example of what we're looking at in this data. So when you look at the average eighth grade mean writ for every kid taking it in mathematics, they're about a 225. Our average is about a 235, so 10 points higher. Well, what do we know about 235? 235 is an algebra readiness, right? Which is where we want our kids to be in eighth grade. 245 is geometry. When you look at where we're starting to see maybe lower achieving growth on the map, it's in geometry skills. Mm -hmm. And so that gives us a good, so, you know, Keyrath, when you're asking, how do we break through to that next level? Mm -hmm. To me, that is a really good indicator, um, especially for our kids in the high achieving end there, they're tr struggling a little bit on map to get past that geometry. Why? Well, most of the kids haven't had that much exposure to detailed geometry yet. And so, Again, that's the kind of analysis that we're doing. What Lauren was talking about at the middle school, and what Liz, I think, is going to allude to in these coming slides on the staff, is, okay, now that we know this, how are we going to continue? We certainly recognize that in order to achieve or close the achievement gap, you need more than a year's worth of growth. Um, that being said, we have to take each kid as an individual. Because one of the other puzzling things about, and again, I'll just stand eighth grade math because I spent the most time there, there's not a big difference between the mean writ and all these different subcategories. And so what that shows me is we're all kind of in the same boat in how do we look at this individualized or how do we individualize it? And that's what I like about O'Neill's plan this year is to really look back at that. I will also tell you, Herrick is doing something very similar yeah. as well. But I'm gonna let Liz go for the, yep, no the rest of the time. <laughs> Can I ask one question? Oh, gotcha. what, what, what is the difference between this false snapshot and what I think? Aren't we going deeper in the weeds? Like, isn't that what the whole October meeting is about? I'm just asking. Yeah. So the fall data snapshot is simply the NWA map assessment that kids took right when they got back. When we go through next month, we are going to look at all this in totality for the end of the last school year oh, because school then we'll year. roll in IAR as well and get a better picture of when we look at all these together, where are we at? And the all reason, of last year's math. Yeah, the reason we can't do that is because those scores are still under embargo and we can't share them yet because the state hasn't released them. Okay. So what this data point does for us as administrators is it allows us to see, okay, when we look at the spring data, we put in plans in place, we put in our interventions. When the kids came back in the fall, we wanna catch any other kids that had a summer slide and affirm those kids that we've already been working through. Then we take a look at um, the IR data and look at it in totality and then really finalize our plans for the second and third trimester as well. Okay. Let me ask one more weird question. <laughs> sure. I just um, like we're, getting, that we're getting the, deep. The fifth grade, <laughs> yes. the fifth grade math number now. Yeah. Is that now basically going to be a non-reliable? I mean, without IAR and some of those components in it, because if we took, I mean, we have quite a few kids that are accelerated or double accelerated, and if that doesn't balance out, like it, it's much harder for them to lose. Sure. Yeah. So those bad. numbers, when we look at that again, that totality number um, in in November, they are represented in that because they did take the fifth grade I or last year's fifth graders did take the fifth grade IAR. This is something that we have been talking to ECRA about in terms of how do we get this number of students represented within our fifth grade data. And there's just something within the connections to the six plus math, math test 
and the fact that these students are um, marked as fifth graders, that's just not correlating within their data. So um, we are actually having a conversation with NWEA, like, okay, what is your guidance in terms of we, we've made the decision to give them the six plus test because that's the content they're receiving. Is, should we switch guidance so that we can capture our students in these growth reports and have them take the two five? math test. So that's a conversation that we're having with NWA, James and I this week. Um, it wouldn't be something we would change this year. We would continue with our path um, for the remainder of this year, but potentially something we'd be looking at for next year. Can we dig in here a little bit more for a second? Would you sure. mind going to slide 11? Sure. Because that was my, my question on, on this, this item as well. And I think, I, I'm pretty sure we're talking about the same thing, but I just want to make sure I understand. Um, Which slide, slide 11, 11 or page 11? Okay. Oh, I was close. <laughs> It's one with the with, yep, with the one. mathematics yeah, um, yep. <coughs> for by grade level. So the this is what uh, Darren's question was about. I I, I just wanted to um, ask about the, the asterisk there next yeah. to uh, fifth grade. So can you kind of explain that to me again? So as I if I understand it, mm -hmm. the the high achieving fifth grade math students aren't included. In that <laughs> so that for, for all intents and purposes, they're treated like sixth and seventh graders. But they are not represented in the sixth and seventh grade numbers. So they, they they're not appear. represented They just anywhere. don't appear okay. on this particular so, so we can find them within ECRA that they are not part they're of They're not the part of this report whatsoever. Correct. So I didn't go back and look at last year's fall data. But was this, a, was this item read last year for math? Because I guess here's my question. So why does it matter? Well, I mean, if we're just looking at these, these like yeah. these like non, what's called the non high achieving students, why is why is that? Um, why would we expect their their growth data to be lower if we take out high yeah. achieving students who we expect to have low growth anyway? No, no, because they're high no, achieving. That we're not wasn't saying that the, at all. We're, yeah. we're, we're just <laughs> making uh, a note uh, that those students are not. When you look at the it. student count, okay, you will so see that the student count is lower. Uh, we would love to see this still being blue or sure. green, okay. for sure. because you right. just have the kids who are in general math here, and that's yes. that's what my, my and we should still expect them to grow, right? right. So that's, that's what yeah. I was kind of concerned yeah. about. Like, yeah, yeah, we're I mean, not dismissing the low good. growth. Good, yeah. right? You see that. I, I, I know we're not attributing the low no. growth to okay. no, because that's, that's what, what you still have now. If you threw all the kids in there, could that color change for the whole grade level? Maybe. Sure. Um, we yeah. actually. In this case, don't mind having it parsed out because it gives us a good sense of kids who are in grade level math versus kids who might be accelerated, what's the difference in that, right? What we're trying to say though too, with the, the point we were talking about at NWA, is NWA appears to be shifting their guidance in terms of who should take the six plus test and who should take the two five test. Mm -hmm. The rule of thumb, you know, for all the years I've been doing math is if you're never, if you're not certain because a kid is high achieving, just put them in the six plus test because the whole test and as a two five test is embedded in the six plus test. NWA has recently changed some of its literature saying that no kid should be taking the grade level test. So our clarifier for that, for NWEA is, does that mean kids that are um, in the grade level class they're in or does that mean just kids across the board if you're in fifth grade you take the two five test no matter what math class you're in so we're just making reference to that saying that that's something we're looking into mm -hmm. when we look at this number though the asterisk is there just to show the student count because when you look most of our grade levels are around 500 kids this one is significantly lower and that's what we're trying to highlight yes. that's the reason i asked the question is because i am 100 confident that the, the values and the beliefs of this administration mm -hmm. wouldn't um, wouldn't align with uh, excuse making. No, no. So that's why I asked it. That's like, like the, 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 no. the, the, are, the optics made me feel like, oh, we're kind of trying to like yeah, no, no, make an excuse for this guy. We just pointing out, and, and if you go back to some of the old presentations, Justin made that point as well <laughs> as we were going through this. This administration is committed to showing the data whether it is great, whether it is bad, whether it's somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. um, that is why we've also attached supplemental hi historical data that we've also shared. Um, what I just want to, you know, again, over emphasize once again is this fall data, none of this came as a surprise to the administration because mm -hmm. this is where we were trending with the spring data. So when kids go home for the summer and they aren't exposed to any new learning and they take a test again, we were expecting, if you remember the conversation we had in the springtime, it was around fifth grade math. It was around, uh, you know, these kids going into eighth grade. Um, so 
this just helps us solidify our planning and make sure that we're you know still paying attention to this and going through it which obviously we are committed to doing i do think once you roll in the iar data though there is a discrepancy between how our kids are performing on that and how they're performing on map which is the opposite of what we had in the district five six years ago and so we've got to keep digging into this data and finding out why but the things that we still <coughs> communicated in the spring are still things that we're looking at right are our kids finishing all the units are we giving those interventions with fidelity are we identifying the right kids for more support those are the things that we continue to look at with our buildings thank you mm -hmm. all right so as we kind of look at next steps in that data analysis and school improvement process each building has held, held tier one meetings to review student data and administer administrators are leading those meetings with ECRA data increasing our understanding of the ECRA model which is still something that the teachers are familiarizing themselves with um, and ensuring that we are supporting all students across all of our buildings um, School improvement planning continues to incorporate that ECRA data to guide our improvement efforts. And our middle schools are structuring their student support periods to focus on specific, um, specified areas of growth using systematic programming. So again, um, Ms. Humphreys alluded to IXL. I know that um, at Herrick, they're um, looking through Khan Academy and then intensive um, intervention supports with Math 180. So we appreciate the board's commitment to providing those um, interventions and those programs for our teachers, um, as well as allowing us time within our professional learning Mondays to really work with our math teams um, to solidify some of these um, processes and, and work on student achievement. Teachers are utilizing both spring and fall student data to make instructional decisions. So they're looking at those students that maybe we saw a, sum, a summer slide in their in their growth um, projections and making sure that we're making adjustments accordingly. Liz, and can then, I jump in there real quick too? I want to highlight this because you know if a board member asks, well, what's different about this year than maybe previous years? I had the opportunity to sit at Herrick's. Um, teacher conversation uh, last Monday when we were going over this data and really looking at it. Remember last year we were introducing the ECRA system to our teachers. Well now teachers have this data at their mm -hmm. fingertips and they can start using it and start having those conversations. And I really do want to credit Justin with laying the groundwork and Liz for implementing it. That was one of the most powerful conversations I've been a part of since I've been the superintendent. And our teachers are looking at this data. They are looking at what went well, um, where can we improve, do we have the kids in the right interventions, are we doing tier one uh, to the best of our ability. So those conversations are happening, they're alive and well, and, and being at all of us were able to go to different schools and look at that, I happen to be at Herrick, and um, you know, even if the data isn't always what you were hoping it would be, it's still important to have that conversation to not make excuses and then to say, where can we do better? And that's happening. Um, and, and so I'm really happy to see where that's evolving in our school. And I know similar conversations were had around O'Neill and throughout the district. Thank you, Liz, sorry. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I just wanna reiterate um, with, with Dr. Russell is saying is that those conversations are happening and we had very pointed um, discussions with our middle school teachers, um, both Ms. Humphreys and Dr. Norman, uh, about what they want to see happening within those student support periods um, moving forward and ensuring that we are giving the students everything that they need to be successful in our classrooms. All right, so then future sharing and discussion. So just in two short weeks, we will come back together <laughs> and um, meet to discuss additional ECRA data, um, committee updates, um, SIP planning overview discussions, um, report card preview, and then our strategic planning presentation and approval. Um, within that same week, you will get a review of all of the building SIP plans um, in your weekly update, and then those will be posted after the curriculum workshop on the 23rd. And then on November 13th, that is our board meeting our district report card will have been um, released that typically happens the last week of October so we're anticipating an October 30th release this year um, and then that's what we will look at finalized IAR data as well as summative designations um, for the October 23rd yes. um, can, on the additional ECRA data yeah. uh, can we look at maybe the subgroups by grade to see especially those fifth through eighth grade <coughs> years okay. where we're seeing there's there's red but there's also blue mm -hmm. but there's also yellow I think and then there's red again like where are we in subgroups on growth over time because I think if you see to Karat's point if you see 
red and then you see green and then you see yellow right mm -hmm. then you know that you're maybe not achieving achieving the growth mm -hmm. over time right if you see red then you see green then you see green then you know that you're continuing that growth so yeah. just to see okay. a little bit more on that data is maybe my only request okay. yeah I'll, I'll put um, an idea together of what that potentially could look like in terms of presentation yeah and share that out before and then we can go from there yeah, yeah. thank you so much this is great <laughs> any other questions or comments no, thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thank you. All right, Start moving on to reports to the board. Uh, first up is the superintendent report, Dr. Wilson. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, hard to believe we're in October, but here we are. I think the weather is starting to turn, so it certainly feels like it. Um, but mm -hmm. with the start of October, October is Principal Appreciation mm -hmm. Month. So on behalf of all of us in District 58, I'd like to give a special shout out and a big thanks to all of our 13 principals. Um, Assistant Principal Month is later on. Uh, so Danielle, don't worry, we won't forget you either. Um, <laughs> But there are some really, really great things going on in our district beyond, um, you know, just test scores and things like that. I know we spend a lot of time on that at the board meetings, but I would encourage anyone, um, if you don't have a Facebook or a, a Twitter account or X or whatever we're calling it <laughs> these days, um, to really take a look at what's going on in our district. Our principals do a great job telling the story of what's going on in our schools, and I would encourage anyone listening to really review these social media accounts because th there are some really great things in supporting students um, through some challenging times. So again, shout out to our principals. Happy Principal Appreciation Month. And we're going to continue to honor our principals all month long in different ways, uh, but especially through social media. So again, uh, feel free to uh, sign up for a Twitter account or Facebook uh, and we'll continue to celebrate our principals. Uh, on tonight's personnel agenda, we'll approve the majority of our stipends for the 23-24 school year. And you got a sense of that when O'Neill presented on their uh, clubs and activities uh, in the same format that you would have seen uh, in previous years. Uh, those are out there. In terms of curriculum instruction, over the last few weeks, assessment reports were sent home, including MAP, Ames Web, and IAR. Obviously, at the board level, we're looking at it in an aggregate form, but parents want to see the individual results for their own children. So all those um, should be sent home. Consistent reporting of assessment results connects our families to the data we use to help determine our instructional decisions in the district. Um, ISA, that's the science assessment, uh, reports will go home with sixth graders next week. So that's the only piece that we haven't sent out yet, but those will go home. In terms of finance, the Health and Wellness Committee's recommendation is on tonight's agenda. Uh, you will see that we are staying very true to the model that the, each individual plan um, has to stand on its own two legs, and so you will see that in the recommendation this evening. Technology, parent-teacher conference registration was successful, so thank you to James and his team. The district utilized, once again, a Power PTC system. While no system is perfect, this system has integrated well with PowerSchool, and um, you know, speaking of keeping people up at night, I know that always is a worry for James, but James and team did a great job uh, getting through that, especially with new staff members. Special services, this is something we're very proud of. District 58 invites all parents of students with IEPs or those who are participating in the special education evaluation process to register for facilitated IEP training. This virtual training will be held on October 11th from 7 to 8.30 p.m. This workshop will outline the new process the district uses uh, during IEP meetings called IEP meeting facilitation. The presentation will explain the process and its benefits and help parents prepare for these important student meetings. Please contact your child's building principal, program coordinator, assistant soup for special services, Jessica Stewart, if you need any assistance with registration. One of the uh, big tenets that we are committed to is kind of demystifying the IEP process for our parents. Um, not everyone is an educator, not everyone has that background, and how can we make that um, more welcoming, more friendly for our parents, and uh, just to have an overall better product as we go through there. So I want to commend Jessica, all of our principals for really working hard on that. Uh, we've had a number of parents sign up for this training already, so we're very excited about this and uh, how we're going to move forward. Okay, for facilities, we had our grand opening of the Bel Air Playground. It was really nice. We had upwards of 75 plus uh, people there. It, it was, again, really good. We also had Representative Stava Murray and Tara Costa Howard there to help dedicate our playground. Uh, Representative Stava Murray was there, even though it's not her district, because she helped get the funds. And then, of course, Tara Costa Howard also supported that, and so she was there as well. We had a great turnout. Fairmount is nearing completion. Uh, we are all going to celebrate when the Fairmount project is done. I want to thank the Fairmount community and the kids in particular. This has gone on for longer than any of us um, would have liked. 
and uh, Kevin Bargo is really um, holding the contractor's feet to the fire, making sure that everything gets done. Um, but we are hoping by the end of this week uh, that that project will be substantially completed. There will still be some things that need to be addressed, but uh, we'll still be able to open the, the playground. So we're hoping that hope, uh, happens sooner rather uh, than later. I also want to thank Kevin and his team, the ROE, the Regional Office of Education, completed their health life safety walkthroughs. That's where they go through all of our schools and say you're ding for that or this isn't working or something like that. I um, want to give Kevin a personal shout out. I've been at the ROE um, because we we're doing our overall big compliance review and the uh, person who oversees the individual health life safety pulled me aside and said, you know, um, your buildings and grounds director is really on top of this better than anyone else in the county knows the stuff. And he said, even some of the things that were out of compliance, I know that they will be addressed right away. And so we're not even going to mark those down because that's how quick Kevin and his team are. So Kevin, uh, great job. Thank you very much for that. And that's not a fun job for Kevin to walk through with the clipboard and tell everybody <laughs> where the, the various violations are. Uh, but we are proud of how we respond to that because it is important to make sure our buildings are uh, safe and secure and ready to go. In terms of public relations, um, we will send out shortly within a week our committee recruitment um, people. Uh, and that means for all the various councils and committees, um, Faith and, and Melissa Jervis have been helping me go through that. So our public can anticipate that we'll be sending that information out. And that's for groups, you know, like the Superintendent's Community Advisory Council, the Curriculum Council, some of the new ones that we're creating in strategic planning. So we're very excited about that process. And one of the things that makes our district so strong is that we have staff and we have families that are always willing to participate. And even people that don't have kids in the school system anymore are always willing to lend a hand. So uh, we're very happy about that and excited for another year working with our community. Fantastic. Uh, any questions or comments? Thank you, Kel. Mm -hmm. All right, that brings us to the monthly business and treasurer's report. Mr. Drayfall. I will start out with the year-to-date report. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out, I uh, pointed out to the FAC on, on Friday morning. Uh, when you look at the year-to-date report, you may say, well, we're doing really well on salaries and benefits comparative to prior years. That's because we had one payroll cycle uh, not uh, that is not in this year as of yet. Um, it's just <coughs> what to do with the dates and the start time for uh, the nine-month or ten-month uh, staff. And because of those of that payroll time, you're mi we're missing one payroll. It comes at the end, uh, but you know you'll see that lag uh, as we uh, we go through the year, uh, mostly on the salaries and benefits uh, in the education fund, <coughs> which because of its size, you know always you know is going to make it look a little skewed. Other than that, we are doing you know uh, as expected, and, and things are coming in um, on the year-to-date reports. Uh, one, uh, Kevin had alluded to the health and wellness, and, and uh, uh, Mr. Harris would give a, a, an update on that in the committee report, so I'll leave that alone. Uh, the one other thing you'll have uh, as a memo or as an informational piece uh, in the packet and something talked about in the FAC is our introduction uh, for the tax levy. We are now, it's the first step for the fiscal year 25 budget because good portion of the levy goes into the 25 budget as well as uh, the uh, half, the back half, second half of the budget for 24 uh, is coming out of this levy. Um, we, you know, like to bring it up and introduce it uh, one meeting before uh, we look at and ask for uh, approval. Uh, so we will be uh, bringing to the board uh, a uh, levy recommendation uh, at the November board meeting uh, that will also be because it will exceed the 5%. We'll have to do a truth and taxation hearing. That's something we did last year. Um, and I think we did, may have done the year before because of the, the tax increment financing district. Uh, but that, was, uh, that is coming due. And you'll have, you have a report in there uh, kind of talking about those estimates and expectations and where that is looking at. Uh, other than that, I don't have anything else unless you have questions. Questions, comments? Thank you. Thank you. All right, that brings us to the Policy Committee. Vice President Harris, you guys met on September 19th. Yeah, the, <clears throat> the Policy Committee meeting uh, was the shortest one that we've ever had. This is, I've, I've been uh, the chair, I think it was about 17 minutes. <laughs> um, 
So that's, uh, I, I like to say, a, a boring policy committee is a good policy committee. Um, the, the recent press update had nothing in it but just legal reference updates. Um, and then the, the one other policy that the policy committee looked at was 7270, which is included in the packet, and that one is called Administering Medicines to Students. And this was updated by this board in the spring, but we left out inadvertently a paragraph about opioid antagonists, and um, we are inserting that here. If you look at the packet, it's, it's the section in, in green. Um, and for, for both the, the policies in the press packet and then this one, 7270, um, we are able to skip a first reading and we're going to approve them tonight because for the, 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 the former, they are, um, there's nothing substantial. There's, there's no re requirement for board discussion because it's just legal references that are being updated. And the latter, that one is, is uh, legally necessary to get that language updated ASAP. So um, that's why we're skipping first reading and we will be, um, and that'll be a, a, an action item tonight to approve um, these policy up updates. Um, any questions? Oh, thank you. All right. All right, the legislative committee met on October 4th. Member Hannes? Yes, so uh, we met last Wednesday. Also a fairly brief meeting for our first meeting of the year, and we spent a little bit of time going over the um, resolutions that are going to be brought forth at the um, delegate assembly in November and there are only five this year which is mm -hmm. fairly unusual there's been some years before where we've seen 20 resolutions <laughs> being brought forward mm -hmm. so this is pretty small and they are all you know fairly non-controversial we've really only spent time discussing really only one of them and it was more just kind of um, wanting to get some additional background information from the administration, um, which Kevin's going to work on between now and then. Um, the five resolutions, just to kind of give you an idea, one of them is regarding industrial construction, um, you know, relative to the location of a school. Um, one of them is regarding school resource officer funding. There's one on bus driver regulations. Um, let's see, there's one. Um, on alternative alternative safe school funding and then the one that we're going to be looking for a little more info on is employment history review um, just to kind of give you a quick background so um, school districts have to now do a little bit more digging regarding candidates for positions and background information and um, following up with former employers and just different things like that um, because of the new faith law requirements and so what this school district who's pro um, proposing this resolution is asking for the, the opportunity to use like a DCFS already kind of created system to do that um, background check work um, just as a means to um, kind of streamline that process so that schools maybe don't have the resources to have a, a staff member who can be dedicated to calling former employers and spending all that time getting that background information, they can just use this already created database that, that DCFS uses. Um, we wanted a little bit more information on what the DCFS system generates. Give us a little bit more on what, what information does that system provide so we can know if it's enough. Is it thorough enough? Is it substantial? That kind of stuff. Um, so Kevin let us know that he would be doing a little bit more digging to provide us with that so we can have a better understanding um, on how we would you know, decide to, to vote on that particular resolution. Um, but other than that, it was pretty quiet. We did talk a little bit about legislative breakfast, which will be coming up in the winter as usual. I think we landed on hopefully February 2nd. Kevin, am I right? Yeah, I'm just double checking right now. I thought that was our first date. First choice was February 2nd with a backup of February 16th, but we were going to dig into looking at um, whether those were good for the majority of legislators, et cetera. And that was pretty much it. Yeah, so hold both those dates if you're able to. Yeah. And uh, you summarize the purpose. I was going to say anything else, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any questions, questions or comments? Thank you, Emily. Mm -hmm. All right, that brings us to the Financial Advisory Committee. We met on October 6th, and um, I'll go through the, the kind of boring quick stuff first. We looked at the year-to-date report, had the same conversation that you, that you heard today. Uh, we did do a, a, a playground update, just looking at the work that was being done, uh, as, as well as the uh, fair amount that was the holdup uh, as well, and just kind of get, get an update on all those components. 
we had um, some conversations around the health insurance rates, which I'm sure Greg will be going into further detail, but that's up for uh, a vote later on today. We talked about the tax levy, just in the fact that obviously any, any years that we have high CPI, um, along with high levels of new construction, that's going to push us over that 105%, which requires us to have that hearing. So we had a little bit of a conversation around uh, that as well. The bulk of our time was talking about the new elementary school lunch plan, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of aspects around that. So we talked a lot about the, the timing and where we're at on this, and we're looking at kind of popping in at the end of October, where people would have an opportunity to start having a lunch provided for them at all of our schools. Uh, I think it was about October 30th was the actual date. They're working on a system now where you'd see the <coughs> menu a week in advance. Um, it would close out, I believe, on Thursday, the week before, uh, Thursday at midnight. That would give them an opportunity to, to get all the components that they would need to successfully make those lunches. Uh, a couple of things of note, just that these are full <coughs> box lunches. These are not the same lunches that we receive at the middle schools. We cannot do those until our middle school lunchrooms are capable. Um, of producing at a higher volume and that we have the warming equipment and stuff that we need at, at the grade schools. Uh, though there was a lot of discussion around that, uh, member uh, Olchek was really trying to see if, if there's ways to escalate that and move that along further. Um, we talked a, a lot about the, um, the risks that are involved with expanding this program and I primarily financial risk to us, like what kind of commitment are we getting into and at what point is this actually costing us out of money pocket because we're not getting enough money from the people buying the lunch uh, and to, to take care of all the administrative costs that, that go along with that. And also the impact, not this year, but if we continue to do this over the next couple of years, the impact that that has on fun lunch. Because if we're part of the National School Lunch Program, you can't have outside lunches you know, brought in. There's rules around that. Um, and do we want to stay on the National Lunch Program, and what does that mean for costs in, in those? And right now, I think the cost that we're landing at is somewhere around $4 a lunch at the ones that would be delivered at the grade school. It could be four fifteen, it could be something like that, but it was going to be um, somewhat around that area. I think the conversation still saw some level of excitement around this. I think we were also hearing uh, a desire to push that a little bit quicker to get some hot lunches in the kids' hands. but. Uh, uh, Steve, I'll, I'll pass it off to you to uh, kind of share any other thoughts that you have yeah, on yeah, yeah, any yeah. of the meeting. But, you know. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just touch on the, the lunch aspect of it. So I guess we're we're committed as a district to make this a success, right? So this <coughs> isn't a, a set it and forget it, right? We're gonna kind of roll it out um, and then take feedback and adjust in real time. So this is gonna be something that um, we just need to continue that energy and momentum to, to make sure that we do communicate it effectively as to kind of what's going to be offered and then take that feedback and adjust uh, very quickly along the way because we are going to have to make changes and this is something that um, we've needed for a long time and it's great to kind of see that it's actually going to be rolling out quickly here. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, to just piggyback off of what Steve said, our desire, we can't wait to get there, is for full hot launch at all of our schools and, um, you know, we will continue to try and we get that done as quickly as possible as we get new kids coming on and all that other stuff. But this is a significant step for us. Um, and I do think so many of our families question why we don't have an elementary lunch program. So this will start getting us on the right track. Certainly is not where we intend to end up uh, after the referendum and all of that. But um, there'll be a lot more conversation with the FAC, a lot more conversation with the Board of Education as we move forward um, into this area. But um, this again, kind of like full day kindergarten, is one of those things for our district that we were lagging behind others and we really need to get caught up. And I do want to reiterate that this will be a conversation that we probably hear a lot because we're making changes. And our new uh, lunch uh, company, Quest, they were there in the FAC meeting with us talking about, and one of the things I will tell you is if any, anybody has middle schoolers, and I know several of us do, uh, if you know at some point they had to go to that dynamic menu because it, because what they've been doing is kind of pivoting and saying, all right, you know, we're looking at what kids are ordering and what they're ordering on repeat. And, um, the example that they were using is they were seeing um, not a lot of people wanting ham, but a, a lot of people wanting turkey. And so they made that pivot, right, you know? And I, I, I'm sure there's other meals in there, but that was the example that he used in, in, in the meeting. So. Um, so far, they've been a good partner in trying to understand and, and provide uh, service to our students that, that fits our families' needs. So 
Um, yeah, any questions or comments? How, uh, <clears throat> how are they handling dietary restrictions and providing things for students that have allergies or vegetarian? So we have, right now, the menu, the, pr the preliminary menu that we were saying is always, there's always three options. Like a good example is obviously everything that they provide um, is not free. Like they have the sun butter uh, example of, you know, there's, there's always, is it always, is that always an option, the sun butter? Or the one, the week that he was showing us. I, I, I think, like yeah, that, that, I mean, I think they start out with that because, you know, there's, it's an easy piece. And obviously it's a lot of, you know, a lot of kids eat it. Uh, yeah, for the, for the elementary packaged uh, lunch program that we'll be rolling out, and the, you know, again, the initial piece, we, you know, we hope that there's several iterations to get us to where we really want to be. Um, but in the initial piece, um, there's a two op there'll be a two option piece. So it'll be, you know, maybe a, a turkey sandwich with the cheese and, and that piece and a sun butter, because uh, no one, you know, we don't do, you know, there's no peanut butter um, in these formats for, for the, any, of the, any of the companies. Um, you know, and then they will accordingly adjust, you know, like they've done at the middle school um, to, to what you know, folks are, are looking at and, and asking for. And, and, you know, so there could, you know, maybe one week there's not a sun butter, you know, thing for every day. It's, you know, two different things and a vegetable option as well. There's, and fresh, and to incorporate fresh vegetables uh, and fruit into that, into that meal as well. It is a national school lunch program structure meal as it is right now um, so it, that has some of its limitations and, and size components and so forth um, and then we'll we'll address and look at and see what we can do to make adjustments uh, you know as we as we work through this yeah like we had a big question around milk milk is a part of this because it's part of the national school lunch program <laughs> we know that not everybody drinks milk or you know wants milk and so uh, what is our fluctuation? You know, what, what abilities do we have within, you know, our requirements uh, to meet that, and also, um, and also provide our students with what they what they want or meet their dietary restrictions. So I, I think I think this trial period at our elementary schools probably over the next couple months is going to be have. That's why we said there's probably going to be a lot of conversations here. What's successful? What's not successful? And what what needs are we not meeting? So that we can understand that as we. Uh, we're considering this a pilot program. This was not something that we, they pushed us off. We couldn't go through the traditional process with the, with the state and everything. So it's kind of this, this pilot program this year. And we're going to have to figure out really by what, February, what we want to start doing for next year. Mm -hmm. So um, we're going to have a couple of months here. We'll run this through the whole school year. But in the next couple of months, we really need to collect a lot of data and understand how, how people are utilizing it, what's the impact of the cost, what is the impact, what are people picking and not picking it. Thanks for that. <coughs> All right. Any, anything else? All right. And that moves us on to the district leadership team. Uh, met actually today. Uh, member White. Uh, yes, Member Doshi and I met today. We this is a follow up meeting from the September 11th meeting that we had for our last monthly board meeting. And again, it was to go over the um, updates to the future strategic plan that is going to be from 23 to 25. Um, this was a, a regroup of sorts today um, and focused on the five focus areas um, that the development team has gone through um, and to give us an extra uh, time to fee give feedback uh, on those five areas and then they were structured and, um, and worked through based on um, the goal, the objective, action plan and how they'd implement it and kind of flushing that out and we will be talking about it at the October board meeting. Um, so it was kind of a regroup. It wasn't as much in the weeds as the last one, I would say, um, because they kind of took the feedback from the group September 11th and incorporated it in the plan this time. So it was kind of a flush out in a second draft, if you will, of what happened on September 11th. Do you have anything else? Yeah, I think at the 23rd workshop, we'll be able to, what you can plan to sink your teeth into is the action plans for each of the priority objectives that bubbled up to the top for each uh, goal area. And so we'll dig into uh, what you can expect to see over the course of the 23-24 school year. Fantastic. Any questions or comments? <coughs> All right, thank you. Uh, next up is the he uh, Health and Wellness Committee. They met on September 28th. Vice President Yep, uh, the Health and Wellness Committee met on September 28th 
really with one agenda item, which was to um, discuss and agree upon our rate increases for January 1. Uh, we did work with, I'm not group alternatives anymore, what's called now? What's Mike's company now? <coughs> Shared Partners? Group, group, partners. group Alternatives. Group. No, I'm sorry, you're right, Shared Partners. Yeah, it was Group I Alternatives. Did, 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 shared Partners. You, you yeah. not the shared Partners, that's our, that's our <coughs> consultancy that we work with, um, and we haven't worked with them for many years. Uh, they're the ones who help with analyze our data and um, kind of look at where we're not, where we're going to be not at the end of this year, but where we're going to be at the end of next year, <coughs> based on the market, based on tra our trends, and um, how how much we need to um, increase the rates by. We do have four plans, but for all intents and purposes, we have two. We have the high deductible, um, the HSA plan, and we have um, the the universal PPO plan. Then we have two uh, the reduced PPO plan and the another high deductible plan that are. Um, have a handful of members on them each, and we, we have them because of, the, uh, because of um, collective bargaining agreements with our smaller bargaining units, and also because of uh, keeping being compliant with the Affordable Care Act. Uh, but so we really look at the two plans when we talk about data, but we are setting rates for all four plans. And uh, the data shows, and the committee um, is recommending a, an 8% increase to the universal plan, uh, zero for the HSA, 8% for the reduced PPO, and then, um, 0% for the high deductible plan. And that is on our agenda uh, for later on during action. And those are the same numbers we saw last month. Those are, yeah. that's about where we thought we, they were going to be. Remember last month when we um, were going <coughs> to switch to our insurance, our insurance um, not providers, or our, our pharmacy. Right, right we yeah. switched, yeah, yeah, yeah. pharmacy benefit manager, yeah, the, PBM. Yeah, benefit manager. <laughs> that is, um, okay. that's, Help the district realize some savings, which um, softened the uh, the increase that we are seeing to the um, the universal plan. Questions or comments on that? Okay, and that brings us to the last one, the SASIT report, Dr. Russell. Yeah, um, things are going very well at SASIT. I, I do want to. Um, you know, just share with the board and publicly, we had a, a staff member from SASID unexpectedly pass away at O'Neill Middle School. I want to really commend our um, two uh, interim superintendents that came over to make sure that not only was the staff members family supported, but also the students and um, the staff of SASID. And, and Lauren, your team did a great job at O'Neill through a very tough situation. And, and our hearts go out to the family and they're in our thoughts and prayers. And we will continue to assist them and SASID in any way. Uh, that we can. I, the mood at SASID um, overall is very, very positive. I think people are, are very excited about the new direction. I have my um, next board meeting coming up on October 16th. Really good financial conversations about long-term viability and the search for the executive director um, is going to be starting very soon. So again, I think all signs are, are pointed in a positive direction. And um, again, I just want to thank Lauren and the assistant or the superintendents for SASID for really helping in a, in a tough situation. But uh, we will continue to update the board, um, especially in terms of the executive director search. And uh, you know, really right now, the update is, is things are going in a positive direction. We'll continue to do so. Questions or comments? All right, we have no discussion items tonight, so that brings us to public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the audience to share a public comment with the board, but is not intended to be a time for members of the public to in enter into a dialogue with the board. Issues raised during public comment may be added to a future agenda item or addressed by administrative staff when appropriate. The board has allotted 30 minutes tonight for public comment. We ask you to keep each of your comments to three minutes to allow everyone an opportunity to speak. I did not see anyone bring us any cards. All right, so with that, I will just open up the floor and see if there's anyone that is interested in making a public comment tonight. Okay, that brings us to the approval of minutes. Are there any suggested revisions to the minutes um, as presented in the packet of materials? If not, is there a motion to approve the minutes of the September 11th, 2023 regular meeting as presented? So moved. Second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Uh, motion carried to approve the minutes from the September 11th, 2023 regular meeting as presented. We have a consent agenda tonight. Are there any items the board member would like to have considered separately? If not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the personnel report and the financial statements consisting of the list of bills? So moved. Second. Second. All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet materials. 
Our first item up for recommendation today is a press issuance 112 policy and policy 7270. Is there a motion to adopt the policy updates presented in the press issue 112 and the correction to policy 7270 as presented in the attached drafts? So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? Who wants to please go roll? Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchek. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the changes to the, um, uh, to adopt the policy updates presented in the press issue 112 and the correction <coughs> policy 7270 as presented in the attached drafts. We have the 2024 health insurance rates. Is there a motion to approve the changes to the medical insurance rates and increase the district contribution to the health savings accounts as listed in the attached memo? So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? All right, let's please cover up. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchek. Aye. Member Hughes. I have a motion carried to approve the changes to the medical insurance rates and increase the district contribution to the health savings accounts as listed in the attached memo. Uh, next up, instructional assistance substitute pay rate. Is there a motion to approve the increase to the substitute instructional assistant daily rate to $110, um, $110 and the hard to fill substitute instructional assistant daily rate to $120? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Let's please go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. <coughs> Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchek. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the increase in the substitute an instructional assistant daily rate to $110 and the hard to fill substitute instructional assistant daily rate to $120. Um, is there a motion to appoint Member Ellis as delegate and Member Doshi as alternate delegate for the 2023 Illinois Association of School Boards Delegate Assembly? So moved. Second. Second. All right, any discussion? All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carried to appoint Member Ellis as delegate and Member Doshi as alter alternate delegate for the 2023 Illinois Association of School Boards Delegate Assembly. Last up is surplus equipment. Is there a motion to designate as surplus equipment the items listed in the attached memo? So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? Well, let's please go roll. <laughs> Member Weiner. Aye. Aye. <coughs> Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye, the motion carried to designate as surplus equipment the items listed in the attached memo. Uh, all right, a couple of uh, announcements. Monday, October 23rd at 7 p.m. will be our curriculum workshop. That will take place at Odeo Middle School. Wednesday, October 25th at 3.45 p.m. will be the Legislative Committee meeting that will also take place at O'Neill Middle School. And on Monday, November 13th at 7 p.m. will be our next regular board meeting right back here at the Downers Grove Village Hall. I have no items tonight for closed session. However, we did have a closed session on September 11th. If anyone would like to discuss the closed minutes that are gonna need to be approved in this meeting, I'm happy to go into close. All right, if not, Is there a motion to approve the minutes from the September 11th, 2023 closed session meeting and keep them permanently closed due to the confidential nature of the contents? So moved. Second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carried. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. <laughs> all those in favor? Aye, Aye. so quick. Any opposed? Aye. Motion carried, the meeting is now adjourned at 9.02 p.m. Aye.